This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on February 6th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. As I said, we have a special episode for you today. We're coming from Drexel University School of Medicine in Philadelphia, where some kind of celebration is going on. <laughs> I don't know what it is because I just do science all the time. But there are a lot of green things throughout this town. And my guest is a professor here in microbiology and immunology, Sandra Ordaneta Hartman. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. I pronounce your name well? Yes, you can say, if you roll your R's, you can say Sandra. Oh, Sandra Ordaneta, Ordaneta. Ordaneta Hartman. But I can also make it easy for others and say Sandra Hartman. And Sandra has the green uh, fingernails, right? For the, um, I, what is it, St. Patty's Day today? <laughs> uh, yeah, early celebration. No, it's my, my my support um, for, for the, the Eagles Very and good. Congratulations. my family that's hardcore Eagles fan. We have Eagles fans here? Yeah, birds. Of course, you know. But you're not all from Philadelphia, I guess. No, I'm all over the place. <laughs> the city of brotherly love. All right, so today we're going to talk about a few unusual things for TWIV, a little bit of science, but we're going to talk about unusual ways of teaching science. And that is what uh, Sandra does here. And, um, but I want to start by uh, going all the way back to the beginning. Tell us a little bit of your background. You're originally from Venezuela, right? Yes, that's correct. So I'm uh, born and raised in Maracaibo, Venezuela. And um, I lived there all my life, went to medical school there at the University of Zulia. That's where I um, re received my MD. And then uh, shortly thereafter, I moved to Pennsylvania and, and got my PhD from uh, Penn State University College of Medicine. So le what, what prompted this pretty big move? You didn't want to stay in Venezuela? Uh, no. I actually, at that time, Venezuela was a very pleasant place to live in on like the current situation there. Um, I just wanted to further advance my career. I always wanted to do science mm -hmm. and research. And I just thought, well, you know, why not keep studying? Okay. So I pursued it. So, so you never PhD. wanted to treat patients, is that right? Uh, not that I didn't want to treat patients, but at that time, believe it or not, the term translational hadn't been coined yet. And I knew I wanted to do research and mm. the way I would describe it. I want to do research that is highly relevant yeah. to the patients. And I want to do something that I can feel and see the direct correlation. Okay. So. Um, I, we did use to get Science Magazine at my home <laughs> in Venezuela. My, my father, who is a physician but not uh, a scientist, he, I, I have no idea why he got a subscription for Science and we mm -hmm. would get it delivered uh, cool. to Venezuela. And he said, you know, someday I, 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 maybe you'll, you'll, you'll be publishing papers like this mm -hmm. or, and so forth. And, did you ever read it? Uh, yes. At uh, that time, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it at that time. I was like, whew, this is like up here. Maybe someday I'll be able to read it and understand what, what, it, what it's saying. But what, that must have played some about. role in your wanting to get a PhD, right? Yes, research. yes. And so then I came, and, and I never thought I would be um, suitable for a postdoctoral position because I, I, I didn't know enough at that time. I was like, well, I don't. I don't know. I don't think I qualify. I'm a foreign graduate. And, you know, I, mm -hmm. uh, so I just, ah, I'm just going to go to school and get a, get a PhD. And, um, now, ironically, in my second year of my PhD this program. This was at Penn State, which Penn campus? Penn State College of Medicine in Hershey. Hershey, okay. And I, I just said, well, you know, I want to learn about this writing grant thing. And I wrote an, <laughs> an RSA. I wasn't, it wasn't a requirement. I just wanted to mm -hmm. do it. And I, I, I wrote an, an RSA. At that time, it was all paper. And as I'm filling in the front page, 
I see that it's everything is just the same and you just had to check a box that either said it was going to be a pre-doctoral or a post-doctoral NRSA. I said, well, I'm doing National, all the National Research Service Award, yes, right? Yes, okay. a National Research Service Award. And and I said, well, you know, what, what, what's the difference? I'm going to go check. Ooh, the stipend is different. So I, I went to my advisor, um, Mary Kay Howitt, and I, I asked her, well, you know, what do you think? What, you know, she said, well, yeah, I think you should, you should look into that because if you can apply for that, you know, you should go for that. So I spoke with my department chair. Um, I contacted the program director at the NIH and they said, well, if your department and your institution considers that your doctoral degree is from a qualified institution, then you can apply for that. And I asked, they said, yes, we consider it. It's from a qualified institution. Mm -hmm. And I checked that box. And it's the first and only time that I've written a grant and it got funded on the first time. And I got a postdoctoral fellowship. So that was kind of like unprecedented at Penn State at that time because mm -hmm. I was a graduate student that was also a postdoctoral fellow. So I thought I wasn't eligible to be a postdoctoral fellow. And here I am um, with a, a postdoctoral NRSA that provided a stipend for the rest of my graduate studies and, and my research and um, at the same time as I was getting mm. a PhD. So it was a combined PhD postdoc. Yep. How many years did you spend there? Uh, it, was, it was five years at Penn State. And what did you work on? Uh, my area of research was a HIV transmission from mother to children through mm -hmm. breastfeeding. Actually, preventing it was specifically the area mm -hmm. of research. So our laboratory uh, was, uh, an area of research in our laboratory was development of microbicides to uh, prevent transmission, not just of HIV, but other uh, sexually transmitted infections such as HPV and herpes simplex virus. And, um, you know, it was one of those little side projects when I rotated through the lab. Uh, you know, I'm interested, um, uh, Mary Kay said, I'm interested in looking if we can use, uh, our, our stellar compound was SDS, sodium to decil sulfate, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that she discovered, she and, 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 and John Kreider, uh, they discovered that they could use it uh, to inactivate enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. And um, because SDS was in, in the generally recognized as safe list of the FDA, and it's widely used in so many household products, including toothpaste, at much higher concentrations than what we needed to inactivate mm. the viruses. She said, well, you know, maybe this could work for breast milk, um, you know, and, and then we can prevent, we can treat breast milk and prevent transmission of HIV through breastfeeding. Do you want to do this in your rotation? Sh sure. And there I was. I'm doing something, research, that I can really see the direct impact mm. in, in, in the population, the patient population. For, so for me, that was, that was a perfect project. And that was the basis of the, of the NRSA, and it got funded. And then after that, I tried to write grants for the, uh, you know, the Gates Foundation, Doris Duke Foundation, and none of those got funded for, for that particular, for that particular project. But, um, yeah, we were able to show that with concentrations as low as 0.1% SDS, we could inactivate, uh, very high titers of envelope, uh, I'm sorry, um, cell associated and, and, in uh, breast milk, right? HIV, in breast so milk. So would you uh, take out the breast milk, treat it, and then it would be, Yes. In, the, in your case, you're just looking for virus. You wouldn't be feeding it to babies. Correct. Yet, right? Correct. So, so I work with breast breast uh, milk banks of America, and mm -hmm. we would okay. collect breast milk samples. Um, we also collected breast milk samples from um, volunteers in the area, and we collected breast milk samples from different stages in the breastfeeding process, um, spectrum because yeah. the composition in milk is varies widely. And then we would spike it in the lab with cell-free mm -hmm. or cell-associated cell uh, virus and treat it with, with SDS. Mm -hmm. And then we also tested removing it from the milk because we thought, oh, maybe, um, you know, the FDA won't let us keep this in, in milk or, mm. or so in the event that we would have to remove it, let's see how we can do okay. it and, and what was the impact <laughs> on the milk. So, so the project yeah. was not just looking at viral inactivation, but it was also 
looking at the immunological right. and nutritional soundness of milk um, before and after treatment. Did you ever get to the point where you did a clinical trial? Or well, from there, um, so so I was Mary Mary Kay Howitt's last graduate student at Penn State, and she came actually to Drexel. She became uh, chair of the Department of Bioscience and Biotechnology, now Department of Biology at main campus. And at the same time, Dr. Wigdall, uh, Brian Wigdall, who's now my department chair here in microbiology and immunology at the College of Medicine, also uh, was also coming from Penn State to Drexel. So, so. From there, we came over here, and we continued with the project here. Um, and and after uh, we arrived here, that was around the time that my funding for the NRSA was ending, but we were able to get funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, that was through a different avenue, because at that time, at around that time, I um, I actually pursued a side job, let's call it that way. Mm -hmm. I um, I cut back my my appointment here at, at Drexel to an adjunct pr uh, professor appointment, and was starting up a company to commercialize the patents that that our laboratory had on on the on using SDS to inactivate okay. uh, enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. So through that company, uh, which was called Renaissance Scientific. Um, we we were able to f form some partnerships, and so we developed a partnership with mm. what was then FHI International in North Carolina and University of Cambridge and others, and we submitted a grant to the Gates Foundation to develop um, a silicone nipple shield device, so this would be a class one device. Um, silicone nipple shields are already in the, on the market for mm -hmm. to assist breastfeeding uh, mothers. And we figured that we could um, put a f like a filter at the tip of the nipple shield that would contain SDS. Mm -hmm. And so mothers would put this very discreet device on their breast just before they would breast, they would start feeding their children. And discreet was extremely important because the main reason why we were working on this project was to um, provide a solution for women in, especially in African countries where breastfeeding is the norm and actually um, HIV infected women would be stigmatized if they would choose not to breastfeed mm. their children because they would give away the status of their infection. So we were very interested in, uh, in devising a way that uh, would offer a solution to these mothers and mm -hmm. their babies. And this seemed to be viable. Uh, we we obtained that uh, that funding. We brought the project here to to the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, and we actually our collaborators at Cambridge uh, un uh, University in in the UK developed even this um, bench top model of breastfeeding, mm -hmm. so it would mimic the pressure um, mm -hmm. at, that the baby <laughs> pre you know generates during yeah, the yeah. process of sucking and. We could process milk, infect it through that, and test test it. So it, it, we we again did did really good progress. We got uh, a couple of publications out of that project, but you know once again the the funding dried up, mm -hmm. and it was very hard to um, regain right, regain funding. Right. So so we kind of like have set that on, uh, aside for a while, but it continues to be. You know, project of Has anyone interest. else picked up this uh, this line of inactivation through breast milk, or is it just your group that was doing that? Well, um, and this part with this particular um, um, process of treating the milk, mm -hmm. we we were at least at that time the 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 only ones yeah. working working on that method. There were, you know, and there still are several groups trying to. Uh, find ways to make breastfeeding safer, but from really chemical treatment, you know, with a compound, we were the ones. But they were, there were, you know, heat treatment was a, a big issue yeah, or a big yeah. approach at that time, and that that had its own <coughs> other um, negative consequences on milk. And um, but in terms of using a, a, a microbicide, we were we were the group okay. that was leading that. So uh, what did you do next? You were here at Drexel. This milk project wasn't moving forward. What did you do? Well, I was in, in, in involved for a couple of years on uh, leading the College of Medicine's effort in women's health research. So um, 
within the Institute for Women's Health and Leadership. And uh, I, I did that for a number of years and organized a couple of conferences on women's health research um, to showcase the research in the area that mm -hmm. was happening here at Drexel University College of Medicine, but also bringing guest speakers right. uh, to, to share their knowledge with us. And then, you know, I, 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 I like to joke around that I am like Cher. I, every time I say, you know, like Cher says she's gonna retire, she mm -hmm. comes back. So I keep reinventing myself. Madonna's also good at that. Well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm that kind of person. Like every uh, couple of years, something would happen. Um, you know, unfortunately, shortly after I came here to Drexel and started working on this project, also with my PhD mentor, unfortunately, she's uh, succumbed to leukemia. So that was a big change for us uh, in, in the laboratory in terms of uh, funding and maintaining the projects and, you know, you have to learn to pivot. So, you know, that was my first reinvention within Drexel. And so mm -hmm. then we had uh, this funding from Gates Foundation and then m my company at Renaissance Scientific, because I had the company, you know, she founded the company and we were in it together. Her, her passing really had an impact on continuing um, the effort in, 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 in the company. So then I came back here to Drexel. So again, a little reinvention every couple of years. And then I was involved with the Institute for Women's Health um, uh, in, in leadership here at the College of Medicine and f for a number of years. And then that center, um, th that the directorship for, for women's health research, that closed after a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, what do I do now? And it was close to the end of my of my time here and then uh, figuring out what am I going to do then. During all these years that I had already been at Drexel, that, that, so I came to Drexel in 2004, and that was by then we were around um, 2010, 2012. Um, I had also um, collected my third degree, which was an MBA <laughs> from Drexel. So I said, well, with all these degrees, I'm, I, I'm, I gotta be able to do something somewhere. Um, you know, and I've, I've gotten pretty good at figuring out on the spot what my next step is going to be. So at that time, I, 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 I always stayed in contact with, with Dr. Brian Wigdell. I had an, a, a secondary appointment here um, in microbiology for, for a, a very long time. And I said, hey, you know, it's, it's my last week here at Drexel. I just want to stop by and say goodbye. Um, you know, it's been a great time. I'm going to go see what, what's up next. And, and Brian said, well, you know, call me immediately. Um, you know, I have an, 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 an opportunity. I really, there's some, there's, I have ideas of, of new things I, I, I want us to do here in the department. And I think you have the skills um, to, to move those projects forward. So, so okay, sure. Uh, uh, well, let's let's. And let's he's talk. here, so he can he can verify he this. He can verify. <laughs> say yeah, that's not true, or yes, it's true. Um, so, uh, so, so at that time, he had already um, started thinking of online education mm -hmm. and uh, for master's programs in in microbiology and immunology and infectious disease. So, but that was. That was and still is not very uh, a common way of instruction in in our field, as you know. So it was, you know, I really he he wanted to organize more of that effort. Mm -hmm. So I came here, and at that time, and uh, it was the Center for Business and Program Development within the Institute for Molecular Medicine and Infectious Disease was established, and I was the founding director of the center, uh, the center with one person in them at, in it at the time. So, which was you. Which was me. Okay. So I said, okay, well, we're going to build this and we're going to start this up. And, and the, some of the faculty had already been working with um, individuals at the uh, Drexel's IT department because mm -hmm. Drexel is, Drexel University is well known for its online education, just not within the College of Medicine, not mm -hmm. within, um, you know, the graduate programs that we were offering here in the, in it, it, in our department, for sure, we, we didn't have them. So um, I said, okay, so we started working. I was kind of like the liaison uh, between the IT department and the instructional designers there and our faculty here and helped organize that effort and work concertedly with all our faculty as well as the, the people that understood the technology. It was a great, huge learning curve, uh, not just for myself, but for all of us. But um, 
we really went into a very rapid development uh, process right away. And since 2012 till today, we now have a total of seven online programs, master's mm -hmm. programs. They each require 36 credits to graduate. Mm -hmm. So they're not, it's not trivial to develop all this coursework in such a, um, a short amount of time. So we have an MS in molecular medicine, an MS in immunology, an MS in infectious disease. And then more recently, we developed these interdisciplinary programs with our partner colleges and schools at Drexel, the MS in biomedicine and business, MS in biomedicine and entrepreneurship, MS in biomedicine and digital media, and the MS in biomedicine and law. All of those programs are available um, online. Anybody can take them or you have to be Any here? No, anybody can take them from, from wherever. Okay. We've had uh, international applicants, out-of-state applicants, and interestingly, we have local uh, students that uh, appreciate the flexibility of online education. So you said these are 36 credit mm -hmm. courses. That's a lot. So how long yeah. does this take, roughly? Um, Full-time, is there are two-year programs, okay. although we have, in the history of our programs, had over-ambitious students that have finished before right. that. But right. full-time, it's two years programs. And we're now um, in the process of revamping the MS in Biomedicine court, uh, program series because mm -hmm. we have a lot of demand from um, individuals that are already in the workforce and are not in that academic cycle fall spring. So we're gonna make those all year round and they will be able to finish those in a year and a half. So, so, how, so would you say this has been a success? You have had a good uptake? A lot of students are taking these? Yes, I, I'd say tremendous success, in fact. Uh, so, so, so the MS in molecular medicine, infectious disease, and immunology, those existed already as face-to-face -face programs. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and then as we were developing the online curriculum, and then we started bridging it into uh, first offering it as a hybrid program mm -hmm. while the whole uh, series of courses were developed. So now we have them in those three varieties. And uh, uh, really, and the, the programs that we have that are available both face-to-face, -face, online as hybrid, I, I'd say that the online segment is the fastest growing of, of those segments. I mean, it, it, it has mm -hmm. really, really uh, attracted a lot of applicants and equally strong applicants. And, 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 and the programs are equally strong, perhaps even, even uh, more demanding in an online environment because you have yeah, to be yeah. constantly present. So, so they're taught by the same faculty. Um, and so in essence, it's, it is the same, exactly yeah, yeah. the same program. Do you have any sense for what these individuals do after they take these courses? What do they do next in their lives? Well, we have the, the, the uh, I can talk about the MS in uh, molecular medicine, infectious disease and immunology because those programs are uh, run longer. Um, and uh, these are all these programs. They fall within the uh, interdisciplinary and career-oriented division mm -hmm. of the graduate school. So they're really preparing individuals to enter the workforce. But we do have a number of students that pursue uh, an advanced degree, a doctoral degree, or want to um, go into a, a p either PhD or, or MD programs. But a significant number of our graduates go into into the workforce and industry. Mm -hmm. Now, the biomedicine interdisciplinary programs, those are brand new. We just launched them in uh, the fall of 2016, so we haven't had our first Got graduate it. yet. Yep. But and, and we get applicants from very diverse background uh, in that area, so mm -hmm. we're really uh, looking forward to see where our first class that will graduate this year, where, where they're gonna go. So that's a uh, pretty good career accomplishment, but you didn't stop there, right? <laughs> No, well, well, but uh, I'm sorry, my boss doesn't let me stop there. <laughs> Blame me. <laughs> <laughs> then, then he says, um, after a year of starting the marathon of the online development, mm -hmm. well, let's keep innovating. Um, you know what, Sandra? I've been thinking about games a lot, about mobile games. I said, like, you know, Brian we can't be Candy Crush, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm like, you know, uh, it's not that easy. And I kept reading all these articles about how hard it is, failure, the production time is always longer than you think, and you don't know what you're going to run into. And I said, what do I know about game development? I don't, they said, well, he said, listen, I want us to look into developing games and and you're it. 
you figure it out once, you know, let's, let's try to do this. The idea would be a game as a teaching tool. Right? As a teaching yeah. tool. Well, but keep in mind that games as teaching tools can be fun. So we could, uh, I mean, our dream is to develop a candy crush that's educational, that, right? Meaning and could sell, have a crossover. Sell, sells a lot of copies. Right? Yes. On the other hand, there's also, in, in specifically in the area of science, mm -hmm. there, there are mobile games out there that were inspired by science and are based by science but weren't designed as educational right. games. So uh, they have some crossover into the uh, uh, higher education or any science education environment, but they weren't specifically designed with uh, learning objectives in mind and right. spe specifically not designed for higher education. But of course, just as a corollary, you learn something when you play a lot of these games. Exactly. Right? Just, uh, at the time you were starting, what were some of these other games? Was Pandemic one of them? Pandemic was, that, was there. There was one uh, which is no longer um, on on the iTunes store, but Virulent, Virulent was another yeah, one. Yeah. Um, and I, so, so, you know. Plague, yeah, Plague, Plague. Plague Inc. was the company that did that, yeah, okay. So, so, so I was like, you know, let, let's look into this. And, and, and so, well, okay. So at that time, uh, I, I submitted a grant up for a, prof a professional enrichment and growth grant, uh, which is funded by the, College of Medicine, mm. Drexel, Drexel's College of Medicine. And um, it was for $10,000. And, you know, I clearly did not know that what I was getting into because I wrote that grant and said, we're going to develop, we're going to focus. So we, we had a game plan. You know, this was obviously all with the support of, of, of Brian. So we had a game plan. We were going to develop our first game is going to be on HIV. We wanted to do it on HIV because it's a strong area of research for us in our department. Mm -hmm. So we had, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we have expertise in many areas of infectious diseases, but it, HIV being one of them, but it was also, you know, in my wheelhouse because it's, it, it's right. my background. So, yeah, we're going to develop this. And, and I said, you know, we're going to have seven levels, advanced, basic, and, you know, the game's just going to be really the candy crush of HIV um, with $10,000. <laughs> and not only the grant was for that, the grant was for me to go to conferences and learn about game-based learning. So we were really stretching these, these $10,000 if we were to receive them. Um, and we, you know, my proposal was selected and we were awarded the, the $10,000. And I did attend, I, as I said, I've never developed a game. I don't know what game-based learning is, but I've heard about it. Had so you, I, Had you played games at all? Oh, yes. I do love to play mobile <laughs> games. I have lots of them on my phone and they're not my children's game. They're my games and they get in trouble if they touch them. Um, yes, I, I, I do like to play games. So that was a plus. Um, that's the one thing I had going on. <laughs> so only mobile games, you're saying? I, right? I, I, yeah, only mobile games. What, what's your favorite one? Uh, it's something that nobody plays. It's called uh, Farm Heroes, and I also like 1010. I devote to those two any little bit of free time I have. I don't care if I don't get three stars. The goal is to advance. So okay. that, that's, okay. that's my goal. And the other thing that I like of this 1010, which I, I could relate to then the game we eventually developed, is that it's... It, you, you play against yourself, and your goal is to get your own personal best got score. It. Okay. So anyway, so we got this grant, ten thousand dollars. I attended uh, my first game-based learning conference at, 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 at CUNY, and just said, "Let me see what this is all about." And it was all this information washing over me. I said, "Oh my gosh, I don't know. I'm going to do this with ten thousand dollars, but we're going to we're going to figure it out." So. With that same fund, uh, with the same funding, I attended then the European Game Based Learning Conference, which that year was in Norway. And uh, I said, well, let, let's, it, again, it was another expedition. And almost like a match made in heaven, I met there a young woman. Her name's Carla Brown. She was finishing her PhD in microbiology at University of Glasgow. But here we have another scientist that was interested in mm. developing games for education, science-based games, and 
I, I, it can't. It this this can't be happening. This was this was an alignment of the stars, you know, that I had to be there. And and I said, like, okay, this is great. And she had developed already a couple of games on her own uh, while she was doing her, her her PhD studies. So I come back from the conference and I said, Brian, I think we can now you know develop our team. We, by then, the Center for Business and Program mm -hmm. Development was uh, had already been uh, staffed in the area of online curriculum development. I said, I think we can, we found somebody that can help us launch this, mm -hmm. this or help us launch it, and uh, this enterprise. So Carla uh, came here. Carla, then? we recruited mm -hmm. Carla as a postdoctoral fellow and she designed then our first game. So the overall, the overall game design, the idea behind it, she did, but she's not a programmer, right? No, she's also a scientist. Um, like she's a bacteriologist by mm. training, so so we worked together in designing. You know, we had to you know work through the science. We worked with our faculty team here. There were our subject matter experts. So mm. this was a really really a big project. Who did the graphics for the game? So again, uh, because Drexel has so much expertise in terms of mm -hmm. the different colleges and schools. We um, worked with students from the di digital media department at, at Westfall College Media Arts and Design mm -hmm. at, at main campus. And Drexel has this co-op program for the undergraduate students where, um, you know, in addition to their four years of, of college, they can have experiential learning through like six months internship mm -hmm. at, at at a real workplace. So um, at that time, I wrote another grant, internal grant, and we obtained provost funding to partially uh, support the cost of a co-op student. So we really developed CD4 Hunter in a total of nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, and that included, you know, reading and understanding all the science, um, you know, for Carla to familiarize herself with with the science of HIV, work with our subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. um, that took a total of three months. Figure out, okay, uh, how she she could then um, envision this as a mm -hmm. game. All the different characters in in the HIV uh, replication cycle as as uh, game characters, and then write a game design document. So that was the first three three months. Then at, at that point, we um, received our, you know, our first co-op student arrives and he was a, a programmer. So he did all the coding. What is it written in? Unity. Unity. Yeah, and I'm learning all these now terms. I don't know how it works. I just know that it was, <laughs> it was with Unity. And it's available for iOS and uh, yes, Android, Yes, so the right? game is available iOS and uh, Android. So this is just a mobile game, right? It's, it's a not, mobile game. Uh, it, it actually, because of the platform in which it was designed, it can also be played on the on on a computer desktop. But we we don't really we haven't launched it that way and promoted okay. it that way because the controls aren't are not. It, it was really designed with a, a, with a mobile device right. in mind uh, rather than a, a computer platform. So, what is the goal of this game? So, the goal of the game is to um, it, you play as HIV, you enter okay. the bloodstream, and you play as HIV. Uh, and you're searching for T cells that are going to express, obviously, CD4, hence the name of the game. We actually uh, crowdsource. We had a poster on the hallway, <laughs> guys, suggest the best name yeah, for the oh, game, cool. you know. Um, <laughs> eventually, CD4 Hunter won. And um, so it, you're HIV in the bloodstream, and you're searching for uh, CD4 positive T cells that express either CCR5. Um, or or uh, or six or four, and so mm -hmm. so th we really aligned this with a curriculum here in our department, and um, again, so we work with the faculty that teach in, in the graduate in the graduate programs, mm -hmm. and said, okay, which topics within your coursework do you teach this? What are the learning objectives? Again, really driven by learning. And then the game and the fun came, okay? But we had to make sure that we mm -hmm. met that and mm -hmm. we could align it. So, so with this game, with the, 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 the we, we focused only, we became very clear that we were not gonna do the seven steps of HIV replication mm -hmm. in advance and basic model. So we really had to 
focus on, into, on binding an entry. So that's the, the premise of the game. Uh, your HIV, find your CD4 positive T cell, match with the proper co-receptor, mm -hmm. and then your goal is to infect as many as you can and replicate. So that's how you advance by infecting more cells. Yes. And so, what's what's getting at the virus? Is there anything preventing so it? So we do have antibodies mm -hmm. that, uh, neutralizing antibodies that come. And you know, keep in mind even that we made it very, it, it is, very strongly scientifically based, you also have to keep in mind game mechanics and make it fun and playable and intuitive. So this is a game that we have even uh, school-age kids, sure, eight and sure. nine-year-olds that can play. So the antibodies come and yes, HIV doesn't just shake off the antibody, so you, but in the game, you know, you the control you off. use, yeah. <laughs> you shake them off so, so you can infect the next cell. Mm -hmm. Obviously in the game, we can't let the virus, uh, the viral population grow uncontrollably because then you can't control the game. So we, mm. it, you know, we decided to to cap this at, at five virions at a time. And mm -hmm. you're also playing against the clock um, because you have 20 seconds, each virion lasts only 20 seconds and you have 20 seconds to then find your next T cell. So they understand the concept or they learn the concept of half-life of uh, the right. virus particles. As and well. we have yeah. monotropic and dual-tropic viruses. Right. So uh, depending, it, there's a lot of, uh, one of the reasons why it, it, we were able to, or, and, and, and this was, you know, I give Carla this credit, is to simplify the mm -hmm. the the uh, binding and and attachment stage is because we color coded things right. so so even right. for for uh, elementary school kids or uh, they they understand okay so i need to to match my the gp120 to the proper co-receptor color because it's not so it's a really a color matching game as well so you need to identify the proper cd4 which is always yellow on the game, and then you need, need to identify the proper co-receptor that your particular variant can infect. And the co-receptor um, is, is, matches the color of the GP120 mm -hmm. that your virus um, expresses. If it's a dual tropic uh, uh, variant, then you would have two, two colors sure, on the, sure. on the yeah, GP120. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, our, we really wanted to, we, we just ran out of time, we really wanted to launch this. Because one important thing with developing this is that you can't let perfection get in the way of the good. Mm. You need a product <laughs> out or otherwise we would still be developing it. So we ran focus groups uh, continuously with a lot of you that are here in, in, in the audience and get the student feedback. Um, mm. Because that's our target audience that will use this, um, you know, not just in terms of the science, but on the game mechanics. We held focus groups with the subject matter experts that help us do this to make sure. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do are we? Do you think that we're representing the science uh, adequately? And and then quickly go back to the drawing board and recode and and, and modify things. Right. So so we wanted to incorporate a mutation generator so you could cash in your points and mutate your virus and all that. But again, it goes back to small budget, short amount of time. So in six months, that game was coded and uh, put in the uh, iTunes and mm -hmm. Google Play Store for when for was this? When, how long ago was it released? Now it was released on June first. 2017. Uh, 2017, okay. the weekend of the ASM Micro that's right. Conference. And that's where, that's, I, that's where I met you. That's when we met. Yeah, yeah so, so we presented a, a, this and two posters there. And um, since then, we've been able to <clears throat> to monitor, you know, we, we, just, we just let it go word of mouth. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have a marketing uh, scheme right now where we're still develop, you know, we want to develop more levels to the game, uh, finish the replication cycle, add complexity, and also develop other games uh, in the areas of infectious yeah, disease and right. immunology. But we're also evaluating the game as a learning tool. The game has an animated tutorial. We had a second co-op student come and develop an animated mm -hmm. tutorial. Um, so we're we're using it uh, the, the evaluation stage that we're doing right now, and my colleague Marianne Kuminale is leading that um, area of, of research. Is we we we're we're testing the game in a population of undergraduate students that are majoring in biology or mm -hmm. a related field that have not had a virology course before, um, or. It's, formal instruction on HIV, at least in the last 12 months. Right. And we've held focus groups with them and had them play. How do you assess 
they're learning from the game though. What, yeah, what so do we're do? doing we're you doing, give them a test afterwards? We do pre and post tests. Okay. <laughs> and actually, so we developed the pre and post test with our faculty here, that the subject matter mm-hmm. experts that helped us develop the game. And um, <clears throat> we would have them take the test before and ask mm-hmm. them if, did you know this answer? Or are you guessing also to do the proper uh, statistical analysis to make sure that, you know, we weren't, they weren't getting the answers correctly just due to guesswork. Yeah, yeah. Um, they played the game for 10, 15 minutes, and then we would test them, test again, them again afterwards. So you see an improvement? Yes, and yeah. anywhere, you know, the, the, some of the basic concepts um, that probably are most in, people are familiar with is CD4 is the receptor. Mm. You know, those are larger concepts that people might have heard of more often that um, the, the, we, we didn't see that much increase in gaining knowledge there because they already knew about that. But then when we went deeper into asking about, uh, you know, the co-receptor usage, what are the structural elements, the names of the, of, of the key viral um, structure yeah, uh, pieces yeah. that participate in this, there we saw a <clears throat> gain of knowledge anywhere from from 72% increase in, 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 in knowledge gain to 80%. Yeah. So, so really depending, you know, the lowest end, okay, just 50% increase when we asked the big question. But when we went, when we dug deeper, we, we see right now, and these are, results are still preliminary. We're still ongoing on this area of research. But then we also evaluated, well, do you think that this would be good in your coursework? Would you like to have games uh, in your coursework? Do you think that this is suitable for higher education? Because that's really where we're 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 aiming, mm. um, or our initial um, interest was to yeah. put the games in higher education. And and you know, there's great acceptance um, anywhere. At least a, a seventy-five to eighty percent want to. Uh, or think it's a good idea to incorporate games. Um, they're like 50-50 split kind of like board games or mobile games. Nobody wants to replace their lectures. They don't want their lectures mm. or textbook replaced. Neither do we. We're not um, into this to get rid of uh, lectures or um, textbooks, uh, but we want to supplement the learning because People learn in different sure, ways. Sure. So we, I teach a virology course uh, every year at Columbia. I'm going to let them do the cla- this in class this year. We have an HIV lecture, and I'll, I'm thinking of having them do it for extra credit, maybe the high score. Would that yeah. be? I mean, the thing is, high score is not just knowledge. It's how good your twitch reflexes are, That's right? That's true. So what is the, uh, what is the actual well, highest possible score you could get? Well, it's unlimited. It is unlimited. It's unlimited. But you said there are only five particles made per infected cell. Right. It's unlimited because you can keep playing for as long as you keep those five particles alive. So I tried this last night and I lasted 10 seconds. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't figure out what to move where and it wasn't binding. And and I think I know this stuff, but... (laughs) So So you can go, you you know, the game has a leaderboard and you can go see your personal best. Um, My dream is to make this a multiplayer game. Um, and would love to be able to change the characters that you play with. You know, right sure, now the sure, game is designed sure. to play as HIV, but it would be great to play as the immune system, for example. Um, but for now, it's a single player game and it's to gain your personal best score. So you can still, maybe next time you try it, you'll last 15 well, I'm gonna, seconds. I want to watch you do it now because, well, the thing is, I mean, I, I'm not a gamer, right? My young kids from when they were eight until now they're in their 20s, they're amazing. I mean, I would try a game and my son would come and grab the mouse and say, you don't know what you're doing and finish the game in an hour. So the young people have the reflexes that you need. And I don't have it anymore. So this is not for me. But, uh, I, you know, the students in my class would certainly do well. So why don't you play? Well, you know Let's what's see. interesting? Uh, we're going to try capturing. And let me quit it because I, I think it's pretty cool when you start the game, you get the Drexel splash screen. Yes. Right? And do, do you have... Do you need volume? Yeah, yeah, yeah you can. Because we it have we, this has sounds. You know, we we really went. Oh, you, sorry. You turned it off. Hang on. Let's start it up. Yeah. So the sound is up here. You know, you don't think about all these details like what music are we going to add to the game? That that was a, also a big thing. The volume's all no. the way up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I like the. Uh, you got a little. You got CD Hunter, and there's a spinning virus. And then their blood cells moving. Yes, and that's, that right? is thanks to our programmer, uh, Vincent Mill, 
Mills. He's from um, an undergraduate student from the digital media program, and he came up through, with that. Uh, it might go through here because we're trying to capture it. Oh yeah, it is. Let's see. Is it? It should be playing music now. It's not, huh? No, I hear it. Well, try it. I can add the music later. Yeah, because we can play it here in the background. And oh, yeah, yeah. What music is it? Um, it's just some electronic thingy. Yes. Okay. It's it's to keep you. Okay. Nice. Okay, so perfect, perfect. It drive me crazy, right? Well, I, you know, guys, and if you're here, download. It's a free download, and play along, and let's let's have a little uh, play match here. So see let's, what see, how, let's see if you can get a high school. So I always tell people, you know, yes, you are a virologist, but that doesn't mean you should skip the tutorial. Okay. Actually, I did look at the tutorial. So, <laughs> so. Um, one thing, so we, so Andrew Andrew Bishop was the second co-op student we had, and he developed this tutorial. So here we see, you know, these are your GP120 envelope proteins, and they can be two colors. And this is the T cell, and your goal is to infect as many as possible. And as you see, the CD, the the, the receptors, we have decoy receptors, but the CD4 receptors are always yellow. Okay, and then you have your co-receptors, which are specific are either pur purple for CXCR4 or blue for CCR5, and you need to match your GP120 to them. Now, if it's a mm -hmm. dualtropic uh, virion, you can go to either one. And if you match, then you replicate. You replicate. Right. And then you can, those viruses come out. And the, all three out, of them, you can control them. You can infect, infect other others. And antibodies come to try to block infection, and, but then you have to shake them off okay. to move on. Now, all this you have to do within the 20 second lifespan of the virion. Otherwise, it okay. becomes colorless, right? Yeah, yeah and, yeah, and yeah. dies, and then game over. Okay, so let's go ahead. So here's my virion. I got purple GP120s. I need to find, and, and the red blood cells get in the way, by the way. So I need to find, um, Let's find a T cell. Ooh, here, this one? No, no, no. That that's not a yellow CD4. Oh my gosh! I'm there. We go. Ah, see, I just killed myself. Oh my gosh! Uh, let's edit that one out. Let's edit. Try again. That was that was just 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 warm up. That's what happened to me last night. There we go. See, here I go. So when you get in, you get a okay. bar. Okay. See. So you get a bar because you have to you have to bind and attach. Okay. So it's not just like because um, initially we didn't do that. And then what happened was, where's Carla when we need her? She's an expert playing her this game. Um, ah, here. Well, at first we didn't make that binding uh, really strong, and so um, what, what it was. Little particles that are? means I have a dual tropic virion. <laughs> so dual tropic virions really ah that red. Oh, antibody attack. Antibody attack. The antibodies are coming. There we go. Ah. Well, in the night, so it's it's very simple. Ah. It's a very simple game mechanics and it's 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 entertaining. We've used this in um, actually for public health education as well. Um, this summer we went to Camp Dreamcatcher which is a summer camp in the area for youth infected or affected by HIV. And we used it to have an, um, an education session about how HIV you know, in, in infects the cells and how actually that, you know, what, is, what it's, the virus is doing. Um, we had a train the trainer session there for the counselors and then we had a session with 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 the campers and you know so it, it's a very um, easy way to convey complex uh, information that otherwise would be pretty hard to to do so ah there we go game so, over i'm so not very good you got 410 no i got 410 is that your, is that your high score um no i think i've gotten to the to the 1000 but let's go to the leaderboard yeah i i i, I you had zero i beat you I was negative. You were negative. 
So, um, so that's your challenge now. You can so go. So as long as you have viruses, the game keeps going. The game keeps going for as long as you right. have viruses. So what are these cells, these gray cells in the background? What are they? Well, we try to, you know, represent, you know, white blood cells. Those are the, those are the whitish gray cells. We just went with really the, the, um, uh, just the basic milieu Got in it. the in the bloodstream, and and we wanted to give the f the idea of a of a flow of uh, you know being in the in the bloodstream sure. and presenting yeah. the challenge that HIV has to face in navigating and going through all those cells to find the correct uh, T cell. You know, it is not easy for, for well, I, I, you know, I, it was fun last night when I was playing. I was really just randomly, I wasn't looking for the right colors because I couldn't find them. I'm not fast enough. But I was just randomly throwing viruses at cells, and that doesn't work, which is probably important an important concept. You have to find the bright cell, not just any cell. Correct. Now, in a real infection, of course, there would be billions of particles, so it would be a lot easier than that than the few that we have here. Right, right, right. Yes. And so, and so, and you know, obviously, it's much more crowded. But again, sure, those are sure. some of the things that we had to pair back in order to make right, this a playable, right. so a playable it's, game. So it's, it, you know, the path forward is quite clear. You can add many things. You could add, as you say, mutation. You can add uh, other cells. You can have uh, resistance mutation um, to the to antivirals, whatever. How how will you be able to do that? I mean, does it depend on this getting wide uh, penetration or? Well, you're not selling this. So no, we're not selling it. We're, 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 well, we decided to give this this first mini game. So we call it, it's a mini game because it's just one level. Yeah. It's a, a very short play time. Um, so we decided to release this mini game as a free download. It, that allows us to test the waters, check the interest. Um, now through through iTunes, we've been we've been following up the analytics, right. and most individuals have downloaded it to so ninety ninety eight percent of the downloads are on iPhone. So to date, um, as of a week ago, we've had over twenty eight hundred downloads, and um, you know like ninety percent of them are in China. So that that's without hmm. you know a, a clear marketing campaign or anything I we we don't know what the interest is um, but that's where the majority of the downloads have have occurred uh, so that's good to know that it's not just on my five devices that we have the game <laughs> so this is so, not on the app store is that right it is on the app store it's an it's on iTunes so if you go to I'm the searching, search I'm and put CD4 hunter two words or one word two words okay but it's it's not no results oh you're not online or you're not connected am, to the I am, internet. I am. It's it's loading the app. Oh, store, oh there so, we go. But it's not um, finding it. I wanted to see how many, if anybody had made comments on it, you know. But it's not turning up. Oh, there. No, Library yeah. Hunter, <laughs> CD4 Hunter. Let me see it. See, CD4. Oh, put capital D, capital C, capital D, cap uh, four. Maybe it's cap. cap no, maybe sensitive. just maybe just CD4. Let's try that. Because I did. Uh, anyway, this is uh, actually a Mac app store, so yeah, it's, no, it should it, it should, should it show, should up, on show the up. It should show up. Put, so here. Try the uh, iOS store. Yeah, uh, that should be. That's where are the apps. Uh, I don't know utilities. I got, here we go. App store. Okay. Oh. Cannot, could, oh, I think that. All right, don't worry about it. But how, have you seen comments on the? Um, no, nobody right have. Now? So, so please go ahead, play it, and comment because we try to encourage. Um, Whenever we speak to to uh, folks, we try to encourage um, yeah, commenting yeah. because that helps uh, helps us make the game better. Mm -hmm. You know, we, some of the comments we've received are oh, well, the tutorial, especially for someone that's not familiar with HIV, the tutorial is uh, can you slow it down a little bit? Um, mm. it, so, so these are types of things that we're collecting the Must feedback. Be pe people of my age, probably. <laughs> Well, no, and even not 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 necessarily, but you know. Just right, so people are playing it. What's your high score out there in the audience? Did you beat? Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> Good and job. I did not pay him to say that. I, I only got four ten. <laughs> and there's no comments, right? So well, so here you go, and then you do. So if you if you go there, then you see what the game. Um, yeah, but we haven't we haven't. 
There are no reviews. That's we haven't had any any yet. Oh, you got to write so some yes. reviews here. So yes, try reviews. it. And well, now that it's on Twiv, you'll get some more people. Yes, I hope so. It, please, hopefully. please, Twiv audience, download it, play it, give us comments because we can only. Um, you know, make things better if we know what needs to be improved. Um, you know, I'm, my family always makes fun at me because I always answer the surveys or when they call me, can I get your feedback? I said, well, mm. I'm at the other end of that now in this situation. I know that you need this to make things to improve a product. So, so, so. La last week on Twib, we had an email from a listener, Jolene, who uh, sent in a game called Immune Quest, which is aimed at teaching you about the immune system and actually was there's a, you know, this journal, Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education, they actually wrote a paper on using it to assess teaching of the immune system, which is very complicated, mm -hmm. right? All these, yes. this jargon. Immune Quest assessment of a video game is a supplement to an undergrad immunology course. I don't know if you know these people, but um, uh, you might want to take a look at that. Yeah. They said... This has multi levels, and the students said as they got to the higher levels, they couldn't remember any of the terminology and it was too confusing. So maybe multi level is too hard. I don't know. And of course, it may be immunology as well, right? That's yeah, it, yes. Um, I mean, I probably would also get confused if it's the first time play, playing an immunology yeah. game. It's def definitely another complex situation. So, so that's, that's, um, you know, that's part of the challenge with this. Sure, and we think sure. that in hindsight, developing just a mini game rather than this full-blown game gave us, first of all, the experience of, uh, our first experience on what does it take to develop a game, um, but also allows us to teach in bite-size, you know, like yeah, snack-size uh, science content. Um, I think it, this game as it is, um, you know, it didn't cover the whole breadth and depth that we initially envisioned, but it really has allowed us to implement it in various different scenarios. Like I said, we went to the summer camp, we've done um, workshops with HIV and AIDS counselor. Uh, coincidentally, when we launched it in June of last year, that's, that's um, AIDS Education Month mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. So there were um, events, public health education events and HIV and AIDS awareness events here in the community. We were able to use that here. Um, so, so, and we've done other local events here mm -hmm. in the city. You said you were at CUNY last week at a gaming conference. Yes. How did that go? How was it received at these kinds of conferences? Well, it was, it was, it was really well, well received. You know, we, we we, it, it's a, it's the CUNY Game Conference 4.0, um, so it's a fourth year, <laughs> and and it's it's a it's a nice uh, conference where uh, faculty from um, mostly the, the, it's it's for higher education primarily, or a lot of the attendees mm -hmm. are in higher education. It's not just for higher education. There's, it's just game-based learning at various different levels. But for us, it's a it's a good um, venue because we get to interact with other sure. uh, faculty in higher education that are doing the same thing. Um, there aren't that uh, many games in the sciences, but there were that we found other colleagues that are also working on this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a game on uh, drug drug development mm. um, at, uh, that, that they were showcasing there. But, you know, it's great because you get feedback. You learn how other people are doing it, how they're getting funded. I mean, the big they were all just surprised that we developed this in just nine months and with such a um, unlimited budget and all really student-based. I mean, I think one of the, if anything, I think what this has allowed us to do here in our department is diversify how we interact with other mm -hmm. uh, colleges and school at the university, uh, with students at other levels. So, so we hadn't before this time, we didn't, we, well, we had a lot of students that come over the summer to do their research that are not graduate students, but we didn't have, we weren't a co-op site for the right, university before right. that. So um, we, we really now have a model where we vertically integrate uh, a lot of the resources in the university and our expertise, and, and, and we really share that a mission. So we, we bring the undergraduate students as a co-op student. We had uh, you know, a postdoctoral fellow. We had multiple faculty that interacted with 
uh, the, the both uh, the postdoc and the undergraduate students. We had our own graduate students be part of the development mm -hmm. process by testing the game and giving us feedback. So, so it really vertically integrated many aspects of the university in, in ways that I personally didn't even envision when we yeah, first started. Sure. And now we yeah. have this MS in <laughs> biomedicine and digital media program that now we're going to have our first graduates. We don't have graduates yet of that program, but you know, when we have our first graduates, that's that's going to be another um, you know, other ambassadors for for what sure, we're doing, sure, and sure. we would be able to provide them an opportunity to also experience game development for for a, you know educational purposes and entertainment purposes that are based in science. And you know, honestly, we're really, really um, fortunate that uh, Drexel University has one of the top digital game design uh, programs in the country. It's mm -hmm. in the top 10. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> their emphasis is in, in game design, animation. They have a really strong interest in uh, games for education. Uh, actually, in general, this era, th this these types of games are called serious games. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, that, that I did not make that up. That is an actual term, serious games, because uh, while they can be fun, their intention is not just pure entertainment. They're meant to have right. an, an educational or even therapeutic. So some serious games are also for health. Right. Um, right. So, um, you know, they have that department also has cool. an interest in serious game development. So. Uh, Again, the stars align in very unique ways yeah. to make this happen. When do you think you'll start the next version? Do you have any plans? Well, uh, tomorrow I start interviewing the uh, our next co-op students that oh. will be joining us, and um, we will we will move on uh, then to the to the next level. Now we have started actually already um, working our our our, our next game. Uh, is, we already have a name for it. Mm -hmm. It's a malaria invasion. Oh, neat. So we already cool. started working on um, a, on a game that's going to be based on the mechanisms by which yeah. Plasmodium cool. falciparum uh, invades the red blood well, cell. Well, when that's done, we'll get you on to This Week in Parasitism. Fantastic. Well, okay. do you know what? <laughs> I'm, I think we should target one for each podcast. We have microbiology. Yes. We're probably going to do a bacteria one yes, at some point. Yes, that's our goal. Uh, we Parasitism. We have This Week in Evolution. You can do lots of things with that. And we have Immune, if you ever do an immunology one. Oh, yes. So no, we'll it's on. on our list of things to do. Very it cool. definitely is. That's no, we, we have a fantastic animation already of the molecular mechanisms by which um, Plasmodium invades the red nice. blood cell. That's very cool. Beautiful video that we've we've uh, uh, developed. I'll have to find and share it with you, and maybe you can capture it later uh, when I get to that link. But yes, our our co-op um, Andrew Bishop, also from the digital media program, worked on on that all summer. And that be cool. uh, you know, the, one yeah. of the greatest things is to see these digital media students speak better science than I do. That's great. You know, that's they're great. just, they're, I said, okay, give me an update. We're, we're, you know, so definitely the student beat the, the, the faculty uh, uh, at, at that point. So they've met enough with the subject matter experts that when, you know, they're giving me an update of where the project is and then they're throwing out all these terms mm -hmm. and uh, you know parasite structure terminology you go, viral structure <laughs> you know I, that i i am in awe you know so well, you, so it you works did even it. To, it, to, you, to you did your job that's great to educate right? others that are non-scientists yeah. in the sciences so i want to just point out that i think we need to wrap up now right because we're we're at noon so we'll yeah. close it i just want to point out that way back in 2008 my son came onto TWIV. He was in the eighth grade at the time. It was episode number seven. And we did an episode with him called Viruses in Video Games. All right. Because he had been, he was a big World of Warcraft player, still is. And it turned out there was an interesting virus thing in that game. So he talked about that. He talked about um, Pandemic 2, which is another infection, dominant, kill the world with an infection. And Bioshock, apparently, uh, he, he was a big Bioshock fan, and there was a, in the, in the first episode, in the first version, there was something to do with plasmids, 
you throw plasmids at other characters to give them new properties. So it wasn't viral, but he talked about that. So that was a lot of fun. And I was listening to it last night, and uh, he, he had a blast at doing that. So I'm going to have him look at this as well. Yes. So he's an expert on uh, virus-based games. We would appreciate <laughs> an expert's feedback. So this has been TWIV. Uh, you can download it at any through any of the apps you use on your iPhone or tablet. You can find it at microbe.tv. If you have any questions or comments, send them to twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, please consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for the ways that you can do that. My guest today has really illustrated how you can do different things in science. It, you don't always have to do research bench science. If you have a PhD and you're trained to do it, you can do other things as well. And people always write us and ask, uh, I, you know, what else can I do besides research? And we try and give people ideas and talk about it. And this is a really great uh, illustration. So uh, thank you for coming on. Sandra Urdaneta Hartman. You got it. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you really for having um, us as as your guest. Is there a website for this game that people could go and look at it too, or is it uh, just the games? Uh, go, yes, just go get so, the so game. we have the website of, uh, at, of the Center for Business and Program Development mm -hmm. at the Institute for Molecular Medicine and Infectious Disease. And so you don't have cd4hunter.com, huh? We, we don't have that yet. We're still within, within the umbrella of the university. So, so I would, uh, you know. You should at least buy the domain because when people hear it now, they're going to buy it and then try and sell it back but, to you. <laughs> but you can follow us on Twitter. Go buy it right now. You can definitely follow us on Twitter. What's at, Twitter? I, at IMMID. IMMID. Uh, Drexel underscore uh -huh. I-M-M-I-D. That's the uh, Twitter? That's the Twitter handle for the Institute for Molecular Medicine and Infectious Disease. Okay, and what about you? And me? You I have a am Twitter handle? At Dr. S.U. Hartman. S.U.? Yes. Hartman. We're with two it. N's at the, Got it. At the end. All right. And, uh, but you can follow the Institute on Twitter. And if you like the game or, you know, post something, hashtag CD4 Hunter. And, um, Very good. And then our website at the Institute is drexel.edu medicine forward slash CD400. Very good. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the introductory music. He's at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. You're so